Thank you very much. I'm afraid I don't have any uh, words of wisdom. I just have words. And so this talk <laughs> is going to be a little bit about uh, engineering. And I'm trying to link it back to, there was the big thing that looked like a lollipop. Oh, yeah, the globe over there. So trying to link engineering to this idea of an interconnected world. Um, here we have this very powerful photograph, I think it's called the blue marble one, of the Earth. And we could spend the whole day talking about all the uh, catastrophic problems facing the world at the moment. We could talk about there are too much of some things, not enough of other things, people getting too old, people not getting old, all those things. But basically there are lots and lots of problems in the world, as we all know. But there are also lots of opportunities to address these particular problems. What we really need are people who actually sit there and go, like you lot, and say, well, we want to change the world. We think the world should be better. These problems should be solved. And we've heard some great talks on that. We also want people who actually want to make a difference, to do something about it. You can sit on the sidelines and go, oh, that's rubbish. That's not very good. That could be better. Or you could say, I want to do something about that. But crucially, you also need the third bit, which is actually to have the ability to do something about it. So the can word is very important. But the great news is there are people in the world who can do this. And these people even have a name. They are engineers. <laughs> now, I'm not getting into the silly debate about what's an engineer, what's not an engineer. But I think it is people who kind of do that stuff there. It's nothing to do with what you study or what your degree is. It's about how you address opportunities and problems. So um, one of the particular things I've been interested in is the way in which there are many different types of engineers doing lots of exciting things. And we have bioengineers and information engineers and mechanical engineers and production engineers. We just pick one group, people who moves people from A to B. So we have people who build bridges, like that great one up there, the Milan Viaduct. We have people who try and move lots and lots of people around. That's a nice engineering problem. That's the big A380 over there. And we have people who've just tried to move two people a very, very long way away and stick them on the moon. That's just one example of what engineers do. But there are, as I say, many, many, many other types of engineers, all of whom do very, very exciting things to change the world, which is what we're all trying to do, I guess, at heart. But what's disappointing is that somehow a lot of people don't get this. It just does my head in that people don't get that engineering is exciting and we can all make a difference and you can learn certain skills to do certain things. So I've, for a few years, been going into local schools to talk about engineering, to try and whip up a bit of enthusiasm, thinking that would be a very easy job. And I can show pictures of things whizzing around very fast and blowing up and flying and all that. But when you ask children, before you give one of these talks, what do you think engineers do? In the UK, you get pictures like this. I just highlight what they are. So they're nearly all of men, which is one thing, going back to the gender conversation earlier, and they're typically men fixing broken things. And you go, well, that's OK. Some engineers do that, and it's a very important role, and it should be done well. So here's the... Uh, fixing the broken train, fixing the broken car. You thought, but don't engineers do a bit more than that? And I thought, well, also, is this a, a UK problem? Is this just the, the British being not quite getting what engineering is about, or some of us not getting it? So uh, we thought, well, is it just about those, that, that particular school I went to? And I found this survey online that, that talked to 11 and 14 year old children and said that engineering is dirty, it's boring, and it's not important. <laughs> We go, OK, so what, what, how is this big disconnect? Maybe it is just something odd in Britain, and great efforts are being made at the moment to change children's perception of engineering, and that's, that's having an effect. But what I quite enjoyed doing was doing this in other countries. So I got some uh, former students to do this in a German uh, school, and we got lot of pictures that were much more for like this. Lots of uh, pictures of people designing stuff. People planning things, look, engineer here, and telling the person, build that building over there. So quite a different view on what engineering is. We then did it also in Italy. Uh, interesting there was there was a much uh, better gender split. So we had roughly 50-50 pictures of females and males. But again, they were designing things, they were building things, they were constructing things. They, and, and then we got even further afield. We went to South Korea and did it there. And I just picked out one picture here. The engineer is building a satellite. So we've gone there from, in the UK, ch children think that engineers fix broken cars, which is one thing that doesn't need doing sometimes. On the other hand, you've got people saying, we're changing the world, we're building buildings, we're building satellites. What was interesting, in all of these countries, we also had a few pictures of South Korean, German and Italian engineers fixing broken cars too. So it's not, you know, it's not uniquely that they're all focused on satellite building. But this is a big issue, which is that we need engineers to fix those problems. And if people don't understand what engineers do, then people aren't going to want to aspire to do it. So what this leads to is a sense that we like the idea of the engineer as a superhero, something like this. And I got a nice guy called Alex Driver to draw this picture up for me. We said, well, that's fine. So we need engineers. We need more of them. That's all well and good. But what we really need 
what we really need to do is to have engineers all around the world connecting to solve problems. And wouldn't it be great if all the engineers that are scattered all around the world were connected? And so for the last bit of the talk, I want to just focus on these interconnections because there are three very important things to do with engineers and connectedness. Number one is engineers are actually very natural connectors. Okay, this is what they naturally do. We as engineers, uh, despite our perhaps overinflated opinion of ourselves sometimes, we don't know everything. And most good engineers know the secret is knowing who does know what you want to know. That made sense? So you have to go out and find the knowledge you need. And this is, has been researched. This is quite interesting. So here is uh, some of our students on the manufacturing engineering tripos. And every time we take pictures of them, they're always in groups. They're always typically doing something as teams. And this reflects the nature of most engineering work. You solve problems in teams. And then this guy here, I've got this quote from uh, James Trevelyan from the University of Western Australia. He, he did a lot of research on going to interview engineers and say, what do you do? Not, oh, I'm a mechanical engineer and I do mechanical things. He said, no, no, what do you do? And the answer came back very, very strongly. An awful lot of engineering work is about social activities. It's about asking questions. It's about telling people stuff. It's about asking things. It's about understanding what you've been told. It's about questioning. It's about working in teams to interact in many, many different ways. And he found this was a huge percentage of the typical engineer's time. And he described it as this. He said, engineering is therefore this idea of it's about distributed expertise. The answers to the world's problems are not in one place. They're scattered around in the brains of many, many people. And the only way you get it to do something useful is by connecting it. And the only way you connect it, or one of the ways you connect it, is through social interactions. So that's where we're trying to link this idea of engineering being a naturally connected thing to this theme of what we're talking about today. So that's the first thing. Engineering is a naturally connected thing. It's not, despite what you might see from watching Big Bang Theory and others, that engineers are not lonely social misfits. Well, there probably are some. No, anyway, move on. So the point is, engineers are naturally connected. Second thing is, we've had, of course, and I don't want to talk about this, it's been uh, done to death, we've gone through a communication revolution. So from telegraph to telephone to mobile phone to internet, which made it possible to have all these great connections with computers, to... Uh, the World Wide Web, which made it usable, and then all the things like Skype and the like, which made it useful. So what we see then is that actually we have to remember how far we've come from the days when mobile phones looked like that, or looked a bit like this. For those of you who are too young to remember, this is what a mobile phone didn't play any games at all. And when computers looked like this, and just to remind you what this thing is, it's a great Cambridge success story, but that's very early little microcomputer. So when Technolo information technology was like this, it wasn't particularly obvious how it was helping engineers to communicate around the globe, but we've advanced so dramatically, so fast, that we have all these great technologies which bring us together very simply. And again, it's a bit of a cheesy thing to do, but you know, as I was putting together this talk, I happened to be working with a colleague, this is Thomas Bonnet from the University of Auckland, who did uh, engineering at Cambridge, and we can collaborate so simply. We can solve problems together, even though he's the other side of the globe, by just clicking something on my screen. And that, that's, we take it for granted now, but that's mind-blowingly clever, the fact that that can happen. That's the second point. The third point is that there are other technologies beyond communication technologies that can help people to uh, help engineers to connect better. And I'm going to end with one little story, which is based on, starts with this patent here. So if you look, lots and lots of words, don't worry about it too much, but up there, some of you will have spotted the clue, for the production of three-dimensional objects so this is one of the very early patents for 3D printing. Okay, and this is from a guy called Charles Hall back in 1986. And there's the picture of the thing. So 3D printing is the idea that whereas a normal printer just lays down one layer, which is typically ink or toner, and just leaves a mark, which you look at, a 3D printer builds up layer <coughs> upon layer upon layer. It's an additive process as opposed to <coughs> subtractive. And there's been huge excitement about 3D printing. But it's not new. It goes back to 1986. But it is quite exciting what it can do. And people have got very, very excited about what it can do. And we have very high-end machines that cost hundreds of thousands of pounds for building bits of jet engines. We have medium-level 3D printers, which can do very, very clever, fully functioning prototypes very, very quickly. Uh, well, not that quickly, but quicker than the other way of doing it. And we have very low-end machines at the bottom end of the market, the ones that you can buy for just a few hundred pounds that can do very clever things too. And I don't want to talk about the super high-end ones and the medium ones. I want to talk about the low-end ones, how even something as, it's very clever this, but relatively uh, simple set of technologies, how something like this is helping engineers to connect. So, go back to the picture of the world. Here's a little story. 
Over here is a man uh, called uh, Richard, Richard Van Aas from South Africa, and he is a carpenter, and he had an accident and lost some fingers, and he wanted to build a new hand, and he saw the cost of them was incredibly high. So he contacted a guy over in the States, a guy called Ivan Owen, who was specialising in props for stage performances and made these mechanical hands. And they started talking to each other, and they communicated through email and internet and all that good stuff. But they couldn't quite work together. And so they got hold of, or were donated, a 3D printer each. And this allowed them to communicate, but actually to say, I've got this sort of design, I'm not quite sure if it's going to work, but I don't understand why it's not working. He would send the plan over to his colleague in the States, who would then print it out and go, ah, yeah, 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 this is what, the component isn't quite right, it's too thin there. He would redesign it, send it back to the guy in South Africa, who could then say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant, but now I want to change it over here and do it a different way. And so it ended up with, there it is, this is the Robo Hand, very low cost, functional, prosthetic hand he built for himself. And then someone heard about this, a mother who had a child who had uh, suffered from, what's it called, um, amniotic band syndrome, so had been born with no fingers on his right hand. And he was, you know, a super little lad called Liam, and he wanted a hand. The cost of a prosthetic hand was too much, and also, of course, children grow, so you need prosthetic hands that need to be replaced regularly. But she saw this and said, but that's super low cost, and of course you can just print new ones as my child grows. And so it's a wonderful way to uh, highlight this point that engineering and connections can happen not just through information technologies, but through technologies like this. We end up with a lovely picture like this of young Liam with his right hand working, with his fingers working, so he could pick up a ball. And that's the result it had on him, made him a very happy boy. And as he grows, they can just continually print new components for new hands so the hand will stay with it, which I think is a, a great use of information technologies to enable engineers to talk to each other and then use other technologies as well. So just to wrap things up, all I want to say is clearly there are huge, huge problems out there in the world that we um, can't possibly solve on our own. We need people who can solve these particular problems. They're called, I like to call them engineers. Those engineers can't do very much on their own. They have to be connected to other engineers. We have fantastic technologies that can do that. And in particular, we have technologies like this, which allow unusual things to happen. And so that little Liam can get his new hand. And I think that's the message to end on, which is we're going to be continually um, amazed that these, these technologies are going to turn up. 3D printing is one example of that. That will allow very unexpected things to happen in ways we just cannot predict. That will allow remarkable things to be achieved, such as young Liam being able to pick up the ball. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.